And do, do you want me to unshare first or not? Um, if you just uh, yeah, no, you leave your slides as it is. Hi, everyone at home. How are you doing? Uh, welcome back to Cambridge University Astronomy. Um, we have a double bill this evening of a uh, nice talk about some ongoing research from one of our astronomers, followed by some stargazing. Fingers very much crossed. Uh, the clouds are a bit patchy, but our observers, uh, as of a few minutes ago, were looking at a very wobbly Jupiter. Um, so, yes, all things being well, we'll go over to some stargazing after the talk. Uh, first up, though, we have Eugene Vasilia, postdoc at the Institute of Astronomy, Cambridge, who's going to be telling us all about galactic archaeology with stellar streams. So over to you, Eugene. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. Today, indeed, we are going to talk about uh, these things, which are called galactic archaeology and stellar streams. As shown in this picture, it's more probably about uh, some sort of galactic fossils. So Strictly speaking, maybe it's paleontology rather than archaeology, but that's the term that is being used in, in the community in the last uh, couple of decades. Because indeed, the galactic archaeology is rather a new field, and it only came into being maybe in the last 20 years or so. And because of that, there aren't really nice pictures showing apart from this, some dubious sci-fi uh, and uh, some dilapidated uh, uh, whatever uh, steamship. But, uh, the real field is about uh, something that is, of course, related to stars. And mostly I will be talking about the Milky Way today. So when we look in the sky, we, of course, see many stars. But as scientists, we are not only there to admire stars, but also to explore their properties, measure some quantities. And there are many things that we can learn about uh, each individual star. For example, you can try to measure its mass or size or luminosity or color and perhaps some other things that are of interest to other people. But uh, these quantities are not uh, a permanent property of a star because uh, uh, size and luminosity and uh, temperature change with time as the star evolves. And the mass is more or less a fixed quantity, but the stars have a variety of masses. And uh, in a given population, there will be a big spectrum of masses. I mean, there will be many stars that are relatively light and a few that are heavier, but that, that tells nothing about where they come from. Instead, what we are focusing in the galactic archaeology field are rather properties of stellar populations. And by that, I mean something that is uh, not a specific uh, feature of one star, but of a whole ensemble of stars that have been born together and brought up into our galaxy as a whole. Um, so these would be age or the formation time, chemical composition, because stars do have different chemical properties, and uh, also orbits in the galaxy, because that's something that uh, may change with time, but also might like much like uh, chemical composition is something innate to a given star and to an entire stellar population. So galactic archaeology is about finding these individual stellar populations, these kind of building blocks in our galaxy, and exploring their origin and uh, determining what what the galaxy is about from these building blocks. So uh, I, to start with, I'll play you a movie. Uh, you probably have, many of you might have seen these kind of movies uh, every now and then. These are simulations of galaxy formation. In this particular case, I'm playing a movie uh, from our colleagues in Sweden called a specific simulation aimed at reproducing the properties of the Milky Way and the local group, the neighborhood of the Milky Way. And uh, we start at the Big Bang. And uh, as you probably know, the structure in the universe forms because of the dark matter in the first place. So the red color here shows the dark matter and it's not exactly uniform. And as it uh, clusters because of the gravitational force, it creates the gravitational wells in which the gas flows, cools down and forms galaxies or proto galaxies. And one of the many objects here on this plot is designated as the future Milky Way. As you see so far, it's rather a messy environment. Early in the universe, there were many clumps that were falling around, merging together and the Milky Way did not come into being as a single entity right away, but it was composed of many small building blocks that were accreted over time. But as time goes on, you notice that there are fewer and fewer these guys flowing to the ground. And now we see that uh, something is approaching here that is designated as the last major merger, that is a merger with a galaxy of comparable size to the Milky Way. And if you look at the numbers here, that still happens quite a while ago, almost 10 billion years ago. So Literally, quite shortly after the Big Bang, we had a period of very rapid growth where many small galaxies were accreted onto the Milky Way. And then 
it kind of slowed down. And you see now that the screen is largely empty. There are a number of smaller objects floating around, but it's much less messy than it used to be before. And the Milky Way itself looks more or less like a regular spiral galaxy with a, a disk uh, rolling in a uh, steady direction. And only once in a while, there are some objects that are still falling into the Milky Way, but largely this is a uh, picture of a relatively quiet evolution. And that is uh, actually something that is rather peculiar to the Milky Way. In many galaxies in the universe don't look like that. And if you were to look into the future, uh, sometime in the future, we'll have the Andromeda galaxy coming into our vicinity and merging with the Milky Way. But that will not happen before a few mega billion years in the future. And for now, the Milky Way is largely in isolation. So the galactic archaeology is indeed something about studying how the Milky Way was assembled from these individual building blocks. And uh, this simulation, as I said, is specifically tailored to reproducing the Milky Way properties. And it's called the uh, Wintergarten, which is uh, in Swedish, the winter road, which is the Milky Way. And by the way, I encourage you to check out a, a nice music band of the same name, which play some sort of uh, uh, music generated by a funny mechanical contraption. It's quite funny to watch. Before we go to the uh, galactic archaeology, I would like to uh, dwell a little bit on the Earth and talk about tides, because that's what gives way to tidal streams that I'm going to talk about later. On the Earth, the tides are generated by the moon and the sun. The tides from the moon are slightly more important, but for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to focus on the tides exerted by the sun. And they come about because the gravitational field of the sun is not uniform. It's stronger when you go closer to the sun. And that's why the side of the Earth that is closer to the sun, uh, it's kind of pulled towards the sun. And the opposite side is not pulled away, but it's because of the centrifugal force. It's kind of uh, pushed away. That's why we form these tidal bulges. And uh, uh, if you think about objects uh, not on the Earth, but in the vicinity of the Earth, like uh, satellites, artificial satellites, or the moon, they stay in the vicinity of the Earth because the gravitation field of the Earth is stronger than of the sun. But that, of course, is limited to a particular region in space. So if you move away from the Earth, now the Earth is sitting here, the sun is here. And if you move towards the sun, at some point, there will be a point where the attraction from the sun takes over. And if you move away, you will not be able to orbit Earth, but you will be orbiting the sun instead. So this region where the gravitation field of the Earth is dominating is called the Hill Sphere. And the points delineating the boundaries of the Hill Sphere are called Lagrange points. And for context, the size of the Hill Sphere is roughly proportional to the mass ratio between the, uh, between the Earth and the Sun to the power of one third. So this ratio is about a million and to, to the power of one third, it's about one to a hundred. So this is a relatively small, it's not strong to scale. It's a small region here. But the distance to the moon is still shorter, otherwise the moon would not be able to orbit Earth. And uh, all of our uh, artificial satellites are still closer. There are st a few satellites that are actually sitting around these points. There is one satellite that is sitting right here and observing the sun. And a few satellites sitting here, one of them is the Gaia satellite, which is going to be featured later in this talk. Another one is soon to be launched, the James Webb Space Telescope. Both will be sitting in this point because that's where they can stay behind the Earth, be shielded from the sun, and uh, orbit together with the Earth in the same orbit. Right, so the Hill Sphere is applicable not only to the uh, planets around the star and sun, but also equally well to stellar systems around the galaxy. So imagine now that you replace the central object by a whole galaxy, the Milky Way, and we put a, another object here that could be a cluster of stars, or it could be a galactic satellite. And um, this object would not be a point mass, uh, like, uh, like Earth is a very small one, but this uh, cluster of stars could be large. And in particular, it could extend beyond the boundaries of the Hill Sphere. And uh, as you could imagine, stars that are uh, beyond the edges of the Hill Sphere, they will not be bound to the cluster anymore. So they will escape and uh, form these sort of tidal streams. So I'm going to illustrate it by a movie playing here. This is a Again, the same picture, central point, mass, the galaxy, galactic satellite, star cluster. And here is just a zoom in region on, uh, on this small region around the satellite. And uh, the contours here show the Hill Sphere. And as I start moving it, 
the stars, uh, they just happily roam around, but some of them, you notice that they escape. They go into the vicinity of the Lagrange points and they start to escape and forming these streams that largely propagate along the same orbit as the uh, satellite itself. And as time goes on, stars escape and the mass of this uh, star cluster decreases. And because of that, the radius of the Hill sphere decreases. As I said, it is proportional to the mass. So it decreases, so more and more stars will be leaving. And eventually, you could imagine that there will be time that the whole satellite is fully disrupted. It happens sooner if the satellite happens to be on eccentric orbit. Here, I was showing an example of a circular orbit. Uh, but if I were to put a satellite on an orbit that is rather eccentric, uh, at the time that it goes closer to the central part of the galaxy, the size of the Hill sphere shrinks and more stars find themselves outside the region of attraction of the satellite. So it experiences some sort of tidal shock. And as it flies away, there will be many more stars leaving the vicinity of the satellite and forming much larger streams. So if you were to play it for some time, you'll notice that the satellite really shrinks to nothing. And when that, at some point when the size of the Hill sphere goes to zero, you don't have a satellite anymore. And if you were to move it forward a little bit, the result will look more like an onion shell with several episodes of stripping forming their distinct uh, things, features on the sky. So this was an illustration, of course, from a simulation. Does it correspond to reality? Uh, yes, indeed, we have examples of uh, these tidal, tidally stripped features in external galaxies. Here are a couple of examples, the most uh, famous ones, perhaps. One is in the galaxy that is seen nearly edge on, much like we see the Milky Way. And we see a huge stream of stars that looks like uh, going perpendicularly to the plane of this galaxy. And we don't see any remnant of it, so it has been fully disrupted already. Here is another example. If you remember the more eccentric orbits, they give rise more like uh, to features more like uh, shells rather than streams. So in this case, apparently there was a uh, galaxy that was accreted on a nearly radial orbit going firmly through the center of the larger galaxy and being shredded to parts instantly. So these are external galaxies, but uh, most of the time when talking about galactic archaeology, we talk about the Milky Way because that's the galaxy that we know the best, of course. And in the Milky Way, we have a lot of examples of stellar streams that really started to be discovered about 20 years ago with the advent of uh, large scale uh, sky surveys. And uh, here is an example of a stellar stream emanating from a global cluster called Palomar 5. Uh, the discovery paper, it's not really very impressive if you take a face value, but there is a cluster and you could see that there are some other densities in this direction. And now, of course, 20 years later, we have a much cleaner view of the same st structure and a much larger region on the sky and uh, with a higher contrast. So this is a prime example of a cluster that is shedding off stars, but is not fully disrupted yet. Here is another example showing a large field of the sky uh, that was observed by the LDSS survey. And in fact, this picture was produced here at the Institute of Astronomy by one of our colleagues. And uh, it shows a number of streams. The most prominent here is the so-called Sagittarius stream, which is formed from a galaxy that is currently being disrupted by the Milky Way. It's uh, our closest satellite and one of the most massive satellites. And it really lives the last days of its life because it's being uh, tidally stripped for the last few billion years. And uh, it, uh, it forms a huge stream on the sky. But you see also there are smaller streaks all across this picture. So indeed, the sky is full of these features. It just takes a dedicated effort to see them. And that became much easier in the recent years with the advent of the uh, galactic uh, astrometric mission uh, in the Gaia satellite that is able to distinguish stars not only in a particular part of the sky, but also moving in a particular direction, because that's what is determining the stream. It's not only the stars are here, but they all move coherently. And Gaia is able to see this motion, and we are able to see these streams much more cleanly if we invoke that. So here is an example of the uh, streams that were discovered just after the Gaia data release a couple of years ago. And th these are only a few of the many streams that we know so far that are streaking all across the sky. 
I should say that this field is rather interesting in the sense that people come up with various fancy names for these streams. Uh, streams, of course, are rivers, and people come up with names which are taken from various mythologies, like uh, Styx is a famous river of the underworld in the Greek mythology. Nyx, I believe, is the kind of male mermaid in the German mythology. And there are a number of uh, Norse uh, names here, a number of names from various other cultures, like uh, uh, from the uh, Indian uh, culture, from uh, Native Americans, and so on and so forth. Unlike uh, many other places in astronomy where we have just numbers, like the star number, whatever, here people do uh, care about uh, nice names, which sometimes you don't even know how to pronounce. Now, these were uh, streams, but uh, remember, if the star, if, if the star cluster has been orbiting around for a long time, and it, if it has been shred uh, apart entirely, after some time we will not be able to distinguish uh, individual features like here. It will be a whole mess. But still, are we able to find out structures that have been uh, tidally stripped a long time ago? The answer is yes. We can look at uh, the space of orbits rather than individual streams. So what I mean by that? Here is another example of uh, a discovery that was made possible by Gaia. And uh, that is a discovery of a major building block in our galaxy formed of a very uh, radially moving stars. Our galaxy is, of course, uh, this galaxy. So most stars in the vicinity of the sun are moving on nearly circular orbits, like this, a green one. But uh, when people look at the distribution of stars in the velocity space, they notice that there is a number of star, a large number of stars that moving are moving together with the disk. So they have circular motion of about 200 kilometers per second, and they have very little radial motion. So really, they are moving in this direction most of the time. But there is a feature and population of stars that are orbiting in a rather different way, that they don't circulate the galaxy in any particular sense, but they have very extended uh, tail of high velocities in the radial direction. So this is what I show here by this red orbit that is moving, that is a very eccentric one and moving uh, on an orbit that takes it closer to the galactic center and much further apart away from uh, the galaxy than the sun is. So these are the leftovers of uh, an early accreted satellite that people here in Cambridge, that's place that this plot was produced. Uh, they called it by a rather mundane name. Uh, and people in the rest of the civilized world called it by a rather fancy mythological name, Gaia Enceladus, Enceladus being the son of Gaia. Gaia is the satellite that discovered the whole thing. So this is an example of an object that we only know uh, in the velocity space, looking at the distribution of stars in the vicinity of the sun. But now imagine they, uh, that these stars, as they move around, here they would have an orbit, the orbit of velocity that is more or less directed in, in the radial direction towards the center of the galaxy. But if I were to take the same star as it moves here in this part of its orbit, it will be moving uh, with this, a velocity that is not directed towards the center, but perpendicularly. So the velocities change. What does not change is the orbit itself. So we are better off with exploring the distribution of stars in the space of orbits rather than in the space of velocities or on the sky. And the orbits are parameterized by a few key quantities like uh, the size of the orbit, the eccentricity of the orbit. So here the circular orbit has an eccentricity zero and the orbit that is very close to radial has eccentricity of one and inclination with respect to galactic plane. So this space of orbital properties uh, is uh, used quite widely, widely to study the features and find out the traces of past accretion events. Like the one that I just presented to you uh, earlier was uh, a big massive accretion event that left its trace in the form of uh, very eccentric orbits. So in this space, the eccentricity goes from zero in the top to one in the bottom. And the inclination with respect to galactic plane goes from left to right. So the stars, or in this case, I'm showing not the stars, but other objects, the globular clusters. Uh, the, the ones that are moving in the, in the galactic plane are sitting here. The ones that are moving in a, with a radial, the very radial orbit are sitting here. There is a bunch of star clusters that are moving in a very specific way that are again sitting in this part of these parameters space. 
that are associated with this Sagittarius galaxy. That, that as I said, is the ma major uh, feature seen in the sky currently being disrupted. And there are a number of other things. The key point is that by looking at the distribution of stars and other objects in the space of orbits, we are able to find structures that are not visible by eye, but are only visible because they are still live in the same uh, orbits that they were accreted from. So this plot with a lot of uh, uh, squiggly colored uh, features is indeed inspired by some other works of art. Here is the uh, painting that uh, gave rise to this diamond shaped plot. And this is a rather uh, inspiring one uh, coming from an early Soviet era Russian expressionist painter called Clement Redko. And it does depict uh, a very revolutionary event, indeed the Russian Revolution, and there is none other than Vladimir Lenin sitting in the center of it. And it came to signify the revolution that Gaia brings to this field. And on the right, it's kind of what we see here when we look at the sky, we really see a mess of things. And what we are after is trying to decipher it and understand what's going on. So what can we learn from analyzing, analysis of these st stellar streams and uh, orbit features in the orbital space coming from the accreted stuff? First of all, we can use stellar streams to understand distribution of mass in our galaxy. And that is possible because of the stars, as they are stripped from, away from the progenitor star cluster, they keep moving on the trajectory that is similar to the original trajectory. So they're moving along the same orbit, as I said. And the orbit, of course, depends on the gravitational potential of the galaxy. So here is an example of uh, stars that are populating a particular stream. And if, they, if we were to make a galaxy very massive, uh, the attraction from the galaxy will be stronger. So the orbit that these, these stars would lie with would be rather this red orbit. So it will be much more curved than the real trajectories. And likewise, if we make the galaxy much fluffier and less mass, they will not be curving as much and they will rather take up this uh, gray orbit. And instead, if you just make the galaxy mass just right, you can fit this stream by an orbit. So in doing so, we can literally weigh the galaxy, the distribution of mass, and that's one possible way that you can learn about the dark matter because that's it's not possible to see it with eyes, but you can see it from the motion of stars, in particular in stellar streams. So that is one application. Another one is to study the chemical evolution. As I said earlier in the talk, uh, the, the different accreted objects, different accreted satellites, they have different chemical signatures. How does that come about? In very short terms, the chemical evolution of stars and gas is an intertwined uh, uh, cir circle of life, so to say. Stars are formed out of the interstellar gas, which has some uh, properties. Uh, it, it is mainly hydrogen with helium, but it has a number of uh, heavier elements. And originally the universe had very little heavy elements. So the first stars were formed mainly out of hydrogen and helium. But as the stars evolve, they of course produce other chemical elements by uh, thermonuclear rea reactions. And then the stars shed off mass by stellar winds or they explode as supernovae. And this gas is returned into the interstellar medium enriched in elements. And the new generation of stars is formed out of gas that is now has different chemical properties. The key point is that this uh, intensity of this circle and the rate of production of various chemical elements depends on where the stars were formed what it was the environment? Was it a dense cloud of gas or not? Was it a massive galaxy with a lot of star forming uh, uh, or not? So once this galaxy, the galaxy satellite was stripped away and accreted onto the Milky Way, its properties are kind of frozen in into the properties of stars that we can now identify. So it's like uh, finding uh, some uh, scattered uh, shards of, uh, of a pot or a flask and trying to assemble back the flask. And by looking at the chemical properties, not only we see at the shape of the flask, but we can also learn about what was inside, the kind of wine was in. And uh, of course, in doing so, assembling these different chemical uh, properties into different building blocks, we can learn about how our galaxy was assembled, uh, how many accreted uh, galactic satellites did it have, when did it happen? How early in the universe? And so on. So this is what we learned so far. 
This is a brief history of their Milky Way as found by these galactic archaeology studies. Starting from the Big Bang, which was about 13.7 billion years ago, the galaxy first, as I said, uh, was living in a very uh, turbulent neighborhood. It was accreting a lot of smaller objects early in, the, in its life. And the largest, last, ma last uh, major merger came about 10 billion years ago. This is this object with a dual name. And there have been a, a number of similar events occurring roughly at the same time. But since then, most of the time, the galaxy was kind of living in a uh, calm and, uh, and calmness and prosperity. And uh, nothing really happened. There were a few smaller things like the Sagittarius galaxy that were swallowed in between, but these are rather mosquitoes. However, just like a Victorian era comes to a rapid and abrupt end, so does our time of isolation of the Milky Way. And uh, what we are having now is a rather major event that is ongoing. This is the merger of the, of the Milky Way with the Magellanic Clouds, which are the largest satellites. And uh, this is a major thing that is probably of a similar scale that the merger that you had before, but it just starts to unfold because the Magellanic Clouds are just recently came into the interaction with the Milky Way. But that's a story for another day. And I'll stop here. Thank you. Wonderful, Eugene. Thank you so much. It's really, really fascinating. Um, so if anyone has any questions uh, for our speaker, please uh, pop them down there in the chat box and I will uh, I will make sure he sees them. Um, one quick question, now, just out of interest, how, how many, because the, these collisions are often little dwarf satellites of our Milky Way, how, how many smaller dwarf galaxies does a big galaxy like our Milky Way generally have? Uh, you mean uh, how many did it already swallow or how many are still remaining? In how, how many are there in total? <laughs> because I, I was going to ask you a follow-up question because I know there's a bit of a question about how many satellite galaxies there are around big galaxies when it mm -hmm. comes to dark matter, right? Because I think there are some theories that suggest there should be absolutely loads of satellites. And yes, when we, yes. we don't really see as many as we think we should. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if you could talk about that for a moment. Yeah, so I think uh, uh, we could expect that the Milky Way has swallowed uh, dozens of smaller objects. And uh, as I said, uh, what we see in the sky, if you just look at the uh, properties of the streams, we do see a number of streams, right? And these are all satellites that are either currently being disrupted or have already been disrupted. And we see now a number of them. We don't always know whether they come from global clusters or from galaxies or dwarf galaxies, but uh, there certainly are many. And uh, there are yet more that are still uh, are to be discovered because if you wait long enough, it will be just uh, the contrast will be too low and you will not be able to see it yet. So I would say that uh, Easily, it could be many dozens of smaller galaxies, but there were only a few big ones. And uh, I think uh, the census of the, of the big galaxies is largely complete. We probably have only as many as listed on, on this scheme. scheme. Uh, so that is to say maybe a handful. Okay, there's a question from YouTube. Um, I, I think I understand the question. Um, let me know if I misinterpret this. Um, so the, the question is, why aren't there planetary streams in the formation of the solar system? And I guess, I guess the question is, mm -hmm. we have, you know, because planets form, the physics of a solar system forming is pretty similar to the physics of a galaxy. Yes. Mm -hmm. disk. Why don't you have little mini, mi mini satellite solar system things crashing into our solar system disk when it's forming? Mm -hmm. Well, actually, we, we do have uh, things like that. These are, these are as asteroids. And many of the asteroids, they do form some sort of streams. And in fact, I marked here the Lagrange points that are most useful for the sun, but there are also Lagrange points that are sitting here and here that are actually hosting satellites. And uh, um, well, uh, you can't see them here, but believe me that there are satellites uh, that are occupying the same orbit as, this, as the Earth and similar satellites sitting around Jupiter. In case of Jupiter, they are actually called Trojans and Greeks, very uh, apt here. And uh, they are essentially leftovers from the early uh, turbulent past of the solar system that are forming satellites, right? And if we, any of the planets somehow could be, I don't know, yeah, you, you could imagine that if, for instance, if uh, in the er early in the solar system history, planets and planetesimals would frequently collide with each other and any such collision would produce a cloud of points and then eventually those points will be forming uh, rings and that's what we see in the protoplanetary disks around other stars. 
Yeah, wonderful question. Uh, sorry, that, that was a question from Ian Lewin. Uh, I should have said thank you, Ian, for that question. Um, and thank you, Eugene, for such a wonderful talk. It's really fascinating to see. I, I absolutely love those pictures of the, that, that rainbow sky full of all those stars uh, crashing into our galaxy. It's pretty remarkable stuff. Um, so yes, thank you to uh, Dr. Eugene Vasiliev uh, for that. Um, we are now going to hopefully switch over to some stargazing. How's the sky looking, guys? Right. Uh, we'll, we'll go over to David first and uh, see how we're doing. Okay. Well, is, is it clear out there? Um, David is in uh, in Barton. Can you see? And, and we can see the fireworks galaxy. This is quite quite a difficult galaxy to see because it's so close to the Milky Way. So we see a lot of foreground stars, and there's a lot of gas and dust obscuring our view, but. You can certainly see the spiral structure. And this is a, a very important galaxy. It's called the Fireworks Galaxy because there have been so many supernovae in, occur in this galaxy. There's been 10 in 100 years. And you consider the Milky Way galaxy has one supernova in 100 years. So this galaxy's had more than any other galaxy uh, supernova in it. And... Uh, and that's despite the fact it's quite a small galaxy. It's about half the size of the Milky Way. As well as a lot of supernovae, there are also a huge amount of star formation going on in this galaxy. So much so that it's been classified as an active starburst galaxy. And another reason it's uh, so important, this galaxy, is that... Um, uh, uh, several years ago, the Large Binocular Telescope in Arizona, currently the largest telescope, optical telescope in the world, was studying this and about two or a dozen other galaxies, nearby galaxies, <laughs> over a four-year period, keeping a close eye on them. And in 2009, a star started to brighten in this galaxy. And of course, astronomers rubbed their hands and they, uh, they, they were going to have a front row seat of yet another supernova. And they watched this supernova in this galaxy. And it, although it brightened considerably, it wasn't bright enough to be a supernova. And then it started to fade and it disappeared from view. And not even the Hubble Space Telescope could see it. And astronomers thought that maybe a cloud of gas and dust were obscuring uh, our view of, of the supernova. So they called on the services of the Spitzer Space Telescope, which was then working. Although it's smaller than the Hubble Space Telescope, it has, is very sensitive in the far infrared. And it would be able to see through any gas and dust. It looked and it couldn't find any sign of this star. The star had simply gone from a red giant and collapsed directly into a black hole, a failed supernova. It's the first and only one to be observed so far. So this is why this, this particular galaxy is important. Now it's thought that many really miss massive stars go from a dying red giant to uh, a black hole and miss out the bright uh, supernova bit. So it's, a, it's a, a lovely tale about this galaxy. And because we're live, you'll see often the image might dim a bit and if we get clouds. So bear with us. We are dodging clouds. That's a cracking view, David. Thank you. Um, also of interest, possibly, is just off to the top corner is a lovely open cluster. Yeah. So yeah that's, a, that's, a, that's a good view, yeah. Yes. Uh, we'll be cover, covering a couple of open clusters later in the tour, if the clouds there's, allow. There's both of them in the same, in the same field of view. Yeah, that's good. 
And of course, the, that, that cluster is in our own Milky Way. Good. OK, thanks, David. And now we'll head to uh, Jonathan in Chesterton. What's it Hello like? there. Hiya. What's it like in there? Um, it's, it's not as good as it was, but it's still OK. I'm standing. You can see my machine here. I don't usually have the lights on, but I thought people might like to have a quick look at this thing. Sorry, it... And what we've managed to do is photograph the Dumbbell Nebula. So I'll just share my screen for that. There you go. That's brilliant. And this, this telescope, unlike all the other telescopes in the observatories we see, will practically fit in a shoebox. So it's, it's, it's a very versatile instrument. And this is the death, not a supernova, this is a death of a dwarf star. And dwarf stars are about the size of the sun, maybe up to about eight solar masses. So these stars die not in a spectacular supernova explosion. As the star runs out of nuclear fuel, it will gradually expand into a red giant and then puff off its outer layers. And we can see the layers have been puffed off. Um, and if we look carefully, Jonathan will point out the white dwarf in the middle of it. Yeah, there it is. Good. And that's all that's left of this star. Uh, it's about half a solar mass and it's very hot. It's about 85,000 degrees when you consider the sun is just uh, 6,000 or so. Um, and this star will now spend the rest of eternity cooling down. While the cloud of material that it's thrown off will carry on expanding and gradually getting fainter and fainter. It's expanding at about 30 kilometers a second and that field of view you're looking at, the, the actual diameter of the expanding gas cloud is about three light years across. So if you do the sums, this star shed that material about 10,000 years ago. So it's been gradually expanding for all that time. And it will gradually it, it, uh, disperse into the interstellar medium where it will collect with other gas and dust and may start to form new stars. So that's a, that's a, a lovely view. And we can see the colors. We've got the pinky colors around the, the outside. And that's yeah. hydrogen. That was the first gas to be thrown off. And then inside we've got uh, a bluey green. Uh, that's that's uh, uh, due to oxygen and nitrogen being thrown off. So even we though can this... just start, we can just start to see a little bit out of the sides here, but it's, yes, it's but... only it's only been photographed for half of the time it usually likes to have. Yeah, and and you've got some slight haze, I think, haven't you? Yeah, you've got yeah. a little little bit of high cloud, but yeah, you, and that's a good that's a good shot. And this is a remarkable telescope. Good. Yep, it's, it's all driven by, by app, an app on my phone. I'll stop sharing that. I just thought people might quite like to see me press the button to go to our next target. Yeah. And uh, off it goes. It's going to go and look for something else now. And we'll come back to you and see if you found it. As yep, I say, okay. this, this is a, a wee telescope compared to the other ones, but uh, it does a cracking job. Okay, many thanks, Jonathan. Right, right. let's go on to Mick in Swaffham Prior. How are your weather conditions, Mick? The weather's okay, but the telescope isn't. It seems to be, uh, I'm not being able to get very much tonight. Oh, right. I started with cloud, tried to do an alignment and it didn't work. And now <laughs> I, I'm not, it's not working very well at all. So I haven't really got anything to show you. Oh, don't worry, not to worry. The, this is half the fun of uh, a live, a live uh, observing session so don't worry because we were going to look at a, a nice colorful double star in andromeda a, a red star and a blue star 
that orbit each other. But I'll we'll try. we'll have a go at that next week if that's I'll okay. Try, I'll you... try my best, but I'll try. Uh, yeah, no, don't worry, don't worry. These things happen. Goodness gracious! I used a different telescope tonight. And I okay, we'll we'll go right. back to David if you're ready. David. Hello. Have you found your next object? <laughs> yes. Good. Uh, okay. I've only got a few frames on it, but. No, let's, that, let's bit. turn you on. Hang on. Yep. All right. That's it. That's another spiral galaxy, a bit smaller than the, the other one. And it's in the constellation of the giraffe, which is uh, directly overhead at the moment. And it's a galaxy seen edge on, uh, like our galaxy is seen edge on. We see the Milky Way as this band. But you can see that there's uh, a dark band of gas and dust going across this galaxy. And it's a spiral arm. It's gas and dust in a spiral arm. But this spiral arm is bent at 45 degrees due to an encounter with a smaller galaxy. If you can go to full screen, David, you should see the other small galaxy. There it is. Yeah, that's a, that little galaxy went whizzing past the bigger galaxy nearly a billion years ago. And that's what's caused this um, galaxy to distort. So it had a traumatic effect on this uh, on this spiral galaxy. It's actually a barred spiral galaxy, like our own Milky Way is. Uh, it has spiral arms, but there's a, a little bar that goes across the nucleus, uh, which was only discovered uh, uh, several years ago in, in the Milky Way, because it's often difficult to see your own galaxy because it, you're so close, that's half the trouble you can't see the wood for the trees but this galaxy also had a supernova that didn't behave it happened three years ago there was a, a, a bright uh, supernova it was spotted by a japanese amateur astronomer um, it was just below those three stars in a row near the top of that galaxy those three stars just go up a bit. Those three there, those, and just below that was the uh, supernova. And it was plainly visible and was photographed by amateurs. So it, it, was, it was very bright. But the, uh, there was a scientific paper just published six months ago, and it's now been confirmed as a new type of supernova. It's called an electron capture supernova. So not many people will have heard of this. And that's because elements like uh, neon, magnesium and oxygen in the dying star eat electrons, which allow it to collapse and go supernova. So we've basically got rough three types of supernova. We've got the brand new electron capture supernova, and then we have supernovae from white dwarfs that gain some extra weight. And then we have the regular supernova from massive stars that come to the end of their lives. So they're the, the three uh, supernovae that we know about. Yeah. And that, that's the other little uh, smaller galaxy. Again, you're, you're getting good results despite the weather conditions. Yeah. What's happening here is that uh, I'm taking 30 second exposures and automatically stacking them. So it's getting brighter as we look at it. Yeah. So as we yeah. watch, the noise reduces and uh, we see, start to see more and more detail emerge. Yeah, we, we can see the band. Uh, going across the uh, nucleus of the galaxy much better now. 
So this is how obviously the image is built up. So that that's good. Okay. Right. Shall we go back to Jonathan's and see how he's got on with his next object, which is a fairly large object. It's the double cluster in Perseus. Okay. I'll have to save in a slightly odd way. I've saved it into WhatsApp. All right. No, so we, we should you've... have an image. There we go. Brilliant. Can you see that okay? Yeah, we can see that. Um, uh, this is a, a fairly large object. And it's probably best seen in binoculars. Or you can certainly see it with the naked eye. It's two fuzzy blobs halfway between the constellation and the, the familiar W shape of the constellation of Cassiopeia. And you can pick it up with the naked eye and it's nice and high at the moment. But it's not much good in a telescope just simply because it's so big. You only see the central portion of one of the clusters. Whereas Jonathan's telescope has a very wide field of view and it can get both of these star clusters in. And these uh, both uh, clusters are both um, about 13 million years old. So they're, they're comparatively young clusters. And what happens to clusters, as we saw in the talk, they'll gradually disperse over hundreds of millions of years. Um, we we've we had a look at uh, a, a few weeks ago at, at a globular cluster. They're much more compact and they don't disperse. They'll stay together for billions of years. Whereas open clusters in the Milky Way, compared to uh, globular clusters which orbit around the Milky Way, these open clusters form in the Milky Way from gas and dust clouds, and then all the young stars gradually uh, disperse as time goes on. And if we, if we look, the bottom star cluster, is this in colour any, by any chance? Yes, it should be. I'm, I'm struggling. I can see one of them. I can see some red stars. Maybe you can see on your screen better than I can see on mine. There are five red stars. Oh, yes, the colours come up much better now. Yeah, I've just zoomed in. Yeah, yeah, I can, I, can see, I can see the five red stars. Yeah, one there. Yeah. One there. No, one that's, there. Uh, that's the white one. Oh, sorry, that's one, but there's one over there. That, yeah, and one diagonally down, and then go to your left. And there's two together. Keep going. Oh, those two there. there. Those two there. Yeah. And those are bigger stars. And they've used up their nuclear fuel and now turned into red giants and are in, in the process of dying. So the stars that form in the cluster are all different sizes. And the sad fact for giant stars <laughs> is they live fast and die young. They'll gallop through their nuclear fuel. And these five stars are the biggest. And of course, they're, they're now running on fumes, whereas all the rest of the stars are much smaller and are going to last uh, a lot longer. So that's uh, that, that bright one, that bright star you showed. Uh, go left. That one. Keep going left to the white star that you oh. pointed to. Oh, is that one over there? No, uh, to the left. Oh, further left. Yeah. That one. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, sorry. You were right. <laughs> that, 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 that one. Yeah. Sorry, I was looking. I got my mouse on your screen. <laughs> <laughs> ah. that, that's, a, that's a fatal mistake. Right. That one is, although it looks bright, is nothing to do with the star cluster. It's oh, pure, okay. pu purely a line of sight job. So uh, that's not part of the star cluster. Yeah, so I'll zoom out. And then that's the other star cluster over here. So yes, zoomed that, in, you that, get a lot more. Yeah, yeah that, that's, uh, they're both about the same age, but they're separated by about 300 light years. So although they formed from the same gas cloud, there is uh, quite a difference 
in distance between them. So they're, they're, they're mostly they're, uh, about 300 um, hot blue young stars in each cluster, uh, surrounded by many more uh, uh, smaller ones. So that's, that's worth looking out for. It, it doesn't have a fancy name. It's just uh, known as the double cluster in Perseus. Okay, what we'll do is we'll come to the end here because- I've we... got 103 for you if you want. Okay, yeah, go to another cluster. Thank you. This was going to be one of Mick's, but Mick was is yeah, having trouble. It was on our list, but- um... Yeah, yeah. No, thanks for fishing that one out. Now this, this one is twice as uh, old as the last cluster we saw, but although it's, it's only got one large star uh, that's gone to a red giant, and it's that one in the middle. That's it. That's the only star that's been big enough, although this cluster is twice as old as the previous cluster, there's only one turned into a red giant. So it's nowhere near as big as those other five stars that went, uh, those other five stars that went red giant in the other cluster. So these is a, a much smaller cluster. And they know there's about 40 stars in this cluster, but there's a problem. This cluster is moving through the galaxy as the, at the same rate as the background stars, because you normally tell uh, how, which stars belong to a cluster because they all move together. But this, these stars in this cluster are moving at the same rate as, and the direction as the background stars. So astronomers don't really know how many stars are in this cluster. Um, they, they know 40 at the moment, but there may, may be many more times. Some people were saying 180 or more. So, but that just shows one of the problems that astronomers have. <coughs> so the, the, again, there's another line of sight star in the way, and that's that bottom bright one. That one, yeah, that's uh, that's uh, just, uh, again, a large star. Um, but the rest uh, are, are, are hot, young blue stars. Good. Okie doke. Thanks very much. And we'll stop there and hand back to Matt. I just say thank you to uh, observers and we'll have another go next week and pick up any more that we missed off our list tonight. Okay, so thanks to our observers, David, Mick and Jonathan, and we'll hand over back to Matt. Wonderful, I, <clears throat> excuse me, and thank you to Brian as well, uh, excellent commentary as always. Um, uh, and thank you to Dr. Eugene Vasiliev, um, who was our headline speaker. Um, so if you enjoyed it, come back next week. Uh, so this time next week, 7.15, we have a talk from Dr. Naomi Robinson, who's going to be telling us all about clusters of galaxies. See you then. <clears throat> cool. Bosh. <laughs>